Kalyan Chakravarti could not uh, join for this uh, sharing. So I have great pleasure to introduce Professor Rita Vrida Munshi, who was earlier in Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, Mumbai, and currently professor in Indian Statistical Institute, Calcutta. Munshi obtained his PhD degree from Princeton University in 2006 under the guidance of Andrew Wiles. He now serves as the chief editor of the Journal of Ramanujan Mathematical Society, and he was awarded the Swarna Jayanti Fellowship by the Department of Science and Technology in 2012 and B.M. Pirla Science Prize in 2013 and was elected as a Fellow of the Indian Academy of Sciences in 2016. So he is also a recipient of Infosys Prize in 2017 and ICTP Ramanujan Prize in 2018. So may I request Rita Brida to start his lecture. Uh, thank you, Vijay. And, uh... Let me thank the other organizers too for their kind invitation. Um, and I am also happy that uh, 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 the proceedings of this conference will come up in the in a special issue of the Journal of uh, Ramanujan Math Society. And as a chief editor, I would like to thank all those who will be contributing to it. And I would also like to thank the guest editors for their uh, for their uh, for accepting to edit this uh, for, uh, special issue. So uh, let me start by sharing my screen. Okay. A video. All right, uh, so the, the topic for uh, today's uh, talk is higher rank exponential sums. So I'm going to explain what I mean by higher rank exponential sums. But uh, let's start with uh, something uh, Ramanujan was very interested in. So the Gauss circle problem. And as you know, uh, it goes back to Gauss. Uh, uh, so it's a quite uh, old problem. So let's uh, denote uh, the number of representation of n as a sum of two square by this Rn, okay? And uh, let, Rx be the summatory function. So I'm looking at the sum of Rn where n is going up to x. Uh, for some technical reason, I'm going to take x to be not an integer. Otherwise, uh, if x is an integer, you have to take half of uh, the Rx right, at the end. So I'm not uh, taking x to be an integer. So my Rx is defined in this way. And this is also equal to the number of lattice points that you have if you take uh, the circle around the origin of radius root x, then the number of lattice points inside the circle is precisely Rx, okay? And Gauss was interested in, in finding out the asymptotics of uh, this uh, function, Rx as x goes to infinity. And it's quite easy to show that uh, as x goes to infinity, asymptotically Rx uh, goes, becomes the area of the circle, which is very natural. And the area of the circle is pi square of the radius, square root, square of the radius being root x, it becomes pi x, okay? And, uh, and he uh, actually was more interested in finding out what is the error. So if I estimate Rx by pi x, I'll be making some error because there will be some lattice points near the edge of the circle. Uh, and uh, so if you take px to be uh, the difference, which is the error term, then uh, the estimation of px is called the Gauss circle problem, okay? And it is easy to prove as Gauss did using simple geometry that uh, px is bounded by square root of x, okay? That uh, you don't need anything, any machinery to prove that it's very simple. But what is expected is much stronger. You expect that px will be bounded by x to the power one quarter plus epsilon, okay? And that is still open, right? So, so what did Ramanujan do here? So he was interested in this problem and uh, he, I think uh, Professor Barnt, um, uh, uh, said something about this Ramanujan's formula, so I'm going to just uh, recall what it was. So px is the error term in that uh, problem, and Ramanujan gave a formula for px uh, in terms of the, the uh, j Bessel function. So this, this j1 is a j Bessel function of rank 1, which by definition is given by uh, this sum, infinite sum, okay? And uh, though in literature it's known as Hardy's theorem because it was published by Hardy in uh, his uh, paper in 1915, 
But in a footnote in his collected works, he says that uh, the form of this equation was suggested to me by Ramnujan, uh, to whom I had communicated the analogous formula for the sum of the divisive functions. Okay, so, so it's clearly uh, the formula um, uh, is due to Ramnujan, but uh, we do not know how he proved it. So, uh, yeah, so, so what is the use of this formula here? So since we have now an expression for the error term in terms of uh, the Bessel function here, right? Uh, so uh, since X is large as X goes to infinity, we have to know how the Bessel function behaves as X goes to. So we have to know what the asymptotics of the Bessel function. And here is a nice formula. So I'm just taking the first uh, term of the asymptotic expansion of the Bessel function. So this is the leading term. And it's quite good because the error term is uh, um, much smaller, right? So the size of the leading term is like one by square root of y. The error term is of size one by y to the power three by two. So you have a saving of y in the error term. And if you plug this in, in place of uh, j1x over here, then you get a formula of px, uh, which looks much simpler, okay? So it, in terms of a trigonometric function, cosine two pi root nx plus pi by four, okay? So it's still, still twisted by uh, Rn, the number of representation of n is sum of two squares. But, okay, so, so if you look at this formula now, and if you trivially estimate it, so as I said before that Gauss had the error term that Px is bounded by x to the power one, one half. And our goal is to show that it's bounded by x to the power one quarter. And so what do you get uh, from this formula? Let's see. So if you just uh, estimate this uh, this sum over here trivially, right? So this is of length capital N, Rn, as you know, is bounded by x n to the power epsilon. So uh, this would be bounded by uh, x n to the power one quarter plus epsilon, right? So you have x to the power one quarter, and since you have n to the power three fourth in the denominator, it's bounded by n to the n to the one quarter. And here from here, the other you get the other error term, which is x to the power half n to the power minus half. And uh, the optimal choice, so n is up to you to choose. You can take n to be any number, okay? The optimal choice you get by equating these two error terms. And if you uh, calculate, you'll see that the optimal choice for n is x to the power one third. So if you pick n to be x to the power one third and trivially estimate the sum over there, you will get the bound that px is bounded by x to the power one third plus epsilon, which is much better than the bound that cows get, right? In fact, this was not new at the time. This was already known to Sipinski from 1906, though he didn't use this formula. Okay, so now it's clear that if you want to improve this error term, the estimate for the error term, you need to get non-trivial estimate for uh, the sum that you had there. Okay, so which is basically Rn times e to the power root nx. So maybe I should say that here that e of z is to me is e to the power two pi i z. Okay, so that's the standard notation in analytic number theory. Okay, um, so uh, so but now what you can do is we have uh, Jacobi's formula, so that gives you an explicit way of writing down the number of representation of n as sum of two square. This is the formula; it's quite simple. And if you replace this over here, then you can reduce this sum to something which is uh, quite quite easy to explain, okay? So this is like, uh, there's a double sum because of course, from uh, divisors D of dividing N, we have to write N as D times M. So it comes up to be a double sum, okay? And so MN is going up to capital N and you have E of alpha MNX to the power one half, okay? So this alpha will be something fixed. So like two or one half or something like that, it's kind of just fixed, okay? So um, to get uh, an estimate of Px, which is better than x to the power one third, what you have to do is get some cancellation in this sum over here that you have, okay? And that's something that you can expect because the, this after all are just points on the circle, right? On the edge of the circle over here. Um, and so as M and N vary that, that uh, those points are kind of randomly distributed on the circle, uh, not really random, but some, looks like random distribution on the circle. And then if you add them up, there will be cancellation. 
And so uh, you should be able to get something non-trivial, okay? okay? And this is an example of what's called an exponential sum. This is uh, the classical exponential sum, all right? So this is an example of a very classical problem uh, where if you want to do something non-trivial, you have to get estimation of uh, non-trivial estimation of certain exponential sum. Now, as, uh, as Hardy mentioned in his uh, in footnote, that he actually mentioned uh, the Dirichlet divisor problem to Ramanujan, which is about uh, the sum of the divisor function, dn in less than code x. And Dirichlet um, proved that the asymptotic that this is x uh, log x plus two gamma minus one, where gamma is the Euler constant, plus an error term delta x. And Dirichlet used his hyperbolic trick to show that this delta x is bounded by x to the power of half plus epsilon. So this is of equal strength of, uh, so Gauss bound, but uh, here it's uh, quite non-trivial. It's not just simple geometry. And again, we expect that the error term will be bounded by x to the power one quarter plus epsilon. So, uh, so in, the, in this particular case, Voronoi in 1904 gave a formula for this delta x, which is the difference of dn and that. And uh, this, this formula is almost the same as what Ramanujan had. Okay, the only difference is in the constant here, which doesn't really matter. The other thing that uh, is different is the, the function that appears over here. Instead of j vessel function, he has a different vessel function. And nevertheless, we have an asymptotic for this function as well. And if we continue the analysis that we have just shown above, then we see that delta x can be written uh, in terms of, uh, again, exponential sums like this. And you will see that, uh, again, if you estimate trivially this exponential sum, then you get the bound x to the power one third, again, as before, which is called the Voronoi's bound. And if you want to do something better than Voronoi, what you need to do is show, show cancellation in this uh, exponential sum, okay? And uh, as before, we can also write the exponential sum, uh, not as a double exponential sum, but a single exponential sum. But here again, we have to then include the divisor function. As before, we had the Rn, Rn function there, right? Okay. So there are two classical problems where to get any improvement, you need to get non-trivial bound for exponential sum. Right? Now, let me uh, define what uh, we really mean by an exponential sum. Uh, so these are sums of this form E of uh, Fn, where small n is written, say, in a dyadic segment between capital N and twice capital N. And F is going to be a real valued function, right? So these points are really on the unit circle. And again, let uh, ex is e to the power two pi x. Okay, this perform. All right. Uh, so our target is to show that there is some cancellation. So we are looking for a bound like n to the power one is a trivial bound minus some delta. Okay. So that's uh, what we are looking for. And uh, uh, so there is a is a is a big theory. Uh, you know, there's a lot of work about uh, this type of exponential sum, starting with Herman Weil, uh, this contribution of Weil, Van der Korkut, Vinogrado, and others. Uh, and uh, the, the main takeaway there is that uh, if we um, denote the rth derivative, so this is the rth derivative of the, the phase function over here. And suppose we know that the rth derivative is of size A capital N to the power one minus R. So the first derivative is of size capital A, okay? And the other, other derivatives are, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, like eight times into the power one minus R, right? Um, then uh, we seek an upper bound of this form. So S, we want it to be bounded by the first derivative to the power K, the length to the power L, okay? And uh, when, uh, when a K, a K L pair satisfies this for a reasonable class of functions f, then that is called an expo exponent pair. Okay, and there is a theory for this yeah, exponent pairs. Uh, the most uh, trivial observation is that the zero one is an exponential uh, exponent pair, because of course uh, then you're just bounding the sum by the length of the sum, so that's easy. A slightly non-trivial uh, observation is that if you uh, look at the collection of the possible exponent pairs. 
then that forms a convex set. Okay, so if you have an uh, exponent pair k1 uh, l1, and if you have another exponent pair k2 l2, so this I'm plotting them in R2, then if you take the line joining k1, anything lying on the line is also an exponent pair. So it's a convex set. Okay. And then uh, there are two different methods of producing a new exponent pair once an exponent pair is given to you. One is called the A process, and that's due to, uh, it follows from the Weil van der Kolb inequality, which says that if KL is an exponent pair, then AKL is also an exponent pair, where AKL is given by this formula, right? And there is a B process, which really depends on Poisson summation. Then uh, it says that if KL is an exponent pair, BKL, which is given by this, so there is a flip there, that a, L takes the place of K and K takes the place of L with a minus half uh, balancing up, okay? And then, and so this also, also is an exponent pair, okay? And the uh, easy thing to check here is that uh, B square is identity. So you get back to the same thing if you flip twice, but uh, of course any power, uh, the A, any power of A is not trivial. So, uh, so using this, we can now generate new exponent pairs, starting with the trivial one. So if I apply the B process to zero one, then I get this exponent pair half half. So the S will be bounded by the first derivative to the power half and the length to the power half. And then again, if I apply A, and then uh, if I apply B and then A, then you get this exponent pair, one, six, two, third. Uh, Okay, and uh, see if we apply this, then you get another exponent pair. So, in this way, we can get an infinite collection of exponent pairs. Okay, as a large collection. Okay, and uh, using this theory, one can prove that uh, the px and delta x are bounded by x to the power 35 by 108. The main point here is that this is smaller than one third. Okay, so it's better than the uh, bound uh, due to Brunoi or Slipinski. Okay, so the main thing is, uh, can we have such a uh, theory for exponential sums which uh, involve higher rank Fourier coefficients? For example, uh, you know, if you look at the divisor uh, problem, then we had dn times an exponential, right? We wrote it as a, uh, as a double exponential sum, but it's actually an exponential twisted by uh, a GL2 Fourier coefficient because dn's are Fourier coefficient of Ashton Stein series. And also for a uh, circle problem, we had R, Rn, E of two root nx. Uh, so the exponential sum is twisted, twisted by Rn over there, where Rn is a uh, Fourier coefficient of a theta function. Okay, so uh, that's what uh, we'll be interested in. Uh, before going to that, I want to uh, use the exponent pairs to say something about estimating uh, the Riemann data function on the um, central line. Okay, so by the approximate functional equation, uh, which is really just an the, the functional equation and just uh, moving the contour of integration, one can show that uh, uh, the, the, expre the theta half plus i t, so this is the, a point on the central line at height t, is bounded by uh, something like this. Okay, so you have to take n going up to square root of t, basically where t is the conductor, so we are going to square up to square root of the conductor. And this reduces to uh, this. So I'm just writing into the power it as e to the power t by two pi log n, right? So, so this is an exponential sum, which naturally arises when you want to estimate the size of the Riemann jeta function. And now if you, uh, so my fy, the phase function is just t by two pi log y, the first derivative. Uh, so since y is between n and two n, the first derivative is of size t by n, right? And we get that uh, this exponential sum over here by exponent pair is bounded by the first derivative t p by n to the power k and times the length to the power l, okay? And if you go on differentiating it, you will see that the condition that you wanted that it's bounded by a into the power one minus r, the rth derivative is true over here, right? So this is the, the bound uh, that you have for that exponential sum. And from this, it follows that if you plug in this bound over here, that the, the Riemann data function is bounded by t to the power k plus l minus half by two, okay? So that is the, where k l is an exponent pair. 
And in particular, if I pick KL to be one six two third, which is you, which you get by applying the A process and the B process to uh, the trivial uh, exponent pair zero one, then you get the strong, uh, a strong bound for the Riemann jeta function which is called the wild bound, which is non-trivial because the, the trivial bound for the jeta is t to the power one quarter. Okay? And if you, but you, you have other choices also, for example, if you take this exponent pair, then you get something sub wild. Okay? So that is smaller than one sixth over here. Okay, so now a natural question here is, uh, yeah, what will be the optimal and Rankin um, did the computation. So he, uh, he looked at, uh, because you have an infinite collection starting in the trivial uh, zero one, you have an infinite collection of exponent pairs, then you can naturally ask what is the minimum of K plus L and Rankin solved the problem and he uh, came out with a constant which is called the Rankin constant. So that's the best bound that you can use just by using the A process and the B process. Okay, so and uh, one nice thing about uh, this uh, one dimension exponential sums is that uh, uh, you have something like this, okay? It's uh, uh, the sum, the exponential sum that we have over here, where is that gone? Yeah, the, yeah, the, the general exponential sum that we have over here is bounded by Oh, sorry, here the B will be N because I'm looking at length N. A is a fast derivative. So this will be bounded by the length times A by the length to the power Q plus one to the, to the exp exponent plus one by A, okay? And the main point here is that uh, if you, even if the length that's capital N is quite small compared to the size of the derivative capital A, you can take Q to be sufficiently large and then uh, this can be made to be smaller than one. So you can get a, a non-trivial bound on this side because N is the trivial bound. And here also, you just need one by A to be smaller than N, right? So sorry, this, this is all N here, sorry about that. Um, so it, it basically means that in case of just uh, rank one exponential sum or classical exponential sum, uh, no matter how short your, uh, uh, sum is you can get in, yeah in most cases you can get a, a non-trivial bound for your sum okay and uh, that's something which is not there as you'll see in the higher dimensional expon higher rank exponential sum will not have that okay so here yeah in in in, in particular for this exponential sum so this is the uh, the sum that comes in the estimation of the Riemann jeta function. So no matter how small you take n to b, you still get a non-trivial bound. Okay, so, and now as I mentioned before, that uh, we want to introduce higher rank exponential sums. So these are exponential sums which involve Fourier coefficients coming from um, uh, uh, automorphic forms from uh, higher, uh, yeah, higher rank groups. So like DNRN, and uh, more generally, what you'll do is you start with a modular form, say of weight K, okay? And uh, this is the Fourier expansion of the modular form at the cost at infinity, okay? And so, uh, so lambda fns over here are, so usually you write a, a n over here, but I'm normalizing it by uh, dividing by the, the actual size of the Fourier coefficient which is n to the power K minus one by two, so this lambda fn are called the normalized Fourier coefficients of the form f, and we want to study uh, this sum, okay? So the Fourier coefficient times e of fn, and f is again real valued, smooth, so sufficiently smooth, and so on. And it, uh, it, uh, it doesn't matter, we can also take capital F to be a mass form, okay? So in that case, the only problem is we do not have a pointwise bound for the Fourier coefficient. It's not yet known. The Ramanujan uh, conjecture is not known for mass forms, but uh, but still we know Ramanujan conjecture on average, which is good enough for our purpose. Okay, so we can also uh, define higher rank exponential sums. So suppose F is an automorphic form for uh, GLD. So this is a D cross a linear group, general linear group of D cross D elements. Uh, and then we find the normalized Whittaker Fourier coefficients to be, okay, so now there would be like 
the Fourier coefficient will be parameterized by d minus one many integers n minus one n one n two etc as n d minus one. Okay, and then uh, we want uh, to look at this exponential sum. Where, okay, so I'm just uh, taking one of them to be n, the other are fixed to be one. You can fix them to be anything else also. That's also interesting. And I'm twisting by an exponential here, right? And f is as before, okay? And one motivation for starting this type of sum is that if you are interested in studying the size of the L function associated with the form on the central line, then you get such exponential sum and you need to get non-trivial bound for such exponential sum where the phase function is just t by log t times log y, and the length is t to the power d by two. Okay. So, uh, so that's one motivation for studying such exponential sum, but there are other reasons too. So one of them is that if you are interested in showing, you know, uh, so like uh, we all know Hardy uh, proved uh, that there are infinitely many zeros of the Riemann zeta function on the central line. And, uh, uh, and uh, for uh, degree two L functions also, we know that there are infinitely many zeros of those L function on the central line. <clears throat> From degree three onwards, it's not known. So for degree three L functions, we don't even know that a trivial, uh, a single zero lies on the central line. And that's an open uh, problem. And if you want to show that, uh, so those zeros are called the critical zeros, right? And if you want to show that uh, given a degree three L function as, uh, zero on the central line, then have to, you have to estimate uh, sums of this type. And you have to show that this is bounded by n to the power five by six minus delta. Okay, so the trivial, it can, you can show that it's bounded by n, but you need to get an one sixth uh, saving and little more than that, which is quite hard actually. Okay, so Today, I'm just going to uh, focus on this particular case where my phase function is going to be just n to the power beta. Okay. And uh, it's not really a bad example because if something works here, there's high chance that it will work in general also. Okay. So I'm just going to look at that. And as I say, as said before that if I take uh, in the case of rank one, uh, it doesn't really matter what the length is. You can take beta to be very large and still get some cancellation over there. And uh, when, uh, on the other hand, if the degree is quite big, if degree is quite general, I said greater than equal to four. So you're looking at GL4 or GL5 automorphic forms. Then we only know the uh, such non-trivial bounds only in the trivial range. Okay, so here, so, so my N is given, I want to see how, how big my beta can be. So for, uh, so if you, so this is the mark D by two by D. So for beta over here, then you can get a non-trivial bound for this. So you can show that this bounded by n to the power one minus delta for some delta, okay? And nothing is known on this side, okay? For general D greater than equal to four. However, for D two and three, we can do uh, something non-trivial. Uh, actually for degree two, it's all, already quite classical. It's about uh, 40 years old. Okay, so uh, two, we can actually take beta going up to three by D, okay, which is three by two. Okay, and this I call the wild threshold. So here you were, uh, so two by D is the trivial one, and this is three by D. So for every D, we know how to get non-trivial bounds for beta lying over here. For D equals to two, you can uh, go up to here. Okay, so you can also cover this part. Nothing is known on this side. So this is kind of the sub while range. So I'll explain what I mean over there for that. And uh, yeah, and the, uh, the main uh, motivation for studying this was again, uh, to get estimates for uh, the L function on the central line. And in 1980, uh, Anton Good used uh, spectral theory of Laplacian on the upper half plane to prove that uh, this is bounded by t to the power one third. So, so for example, here you can take capital F to be the Ramanujan's discriminant function, which is a modular form of weight 12 and uh, level one. And a good show that if you look at the associated L function, the growth of that L function on the central line is bounded by t to the power one third. Okay, t to the power one half is the trivial bound here. 
And T to the power one third uh, corresponds to the wild bound because uh, this is kind of analogous to the square of, uh, of the Riemann jeta function. So this corresponds to the wild bound. Okay, but Utila uh, employed classical methods and it used Voronoi summation formula uh, to uh, get a non trivial bound. And actually, he proved uh, Good's result, but without using the spectral theory of Laplacian of the upper half plane. Okay. So it's, it's much uh, softer than uh, Good's approach. Okay, so that's uh, more or less uh, what we know about uh, degree two. So we uh, do not know whether we can take beta on this side. Okay. Uh, so that's the problem I was interested in because I was uh, I wanted to get uh, something better than good over here. So I wanted to get d to the power one third minus delta over here. And, but uh, there is a catch over uh, here because, you know, so let me just uh, explain this. Yeah. Okay, so if I want to estimate L half plus I T F, then I'm splitting it up into blocks and I have to look at exponential sums like this with N of size capital N and this capital N will go up to T, okay, basically. So there will be blocks. So this is for N equals to one. And then, so you have blocks and then it will go up to N equals to T. So for each block, uh, you'll be estimating this but uh, if you want to get t to the power one third, then for n uh, less than equal to t to the power two third, you can just get use the trivial bound. So on this side, you can use the trivial bound. And for n greater than equal to greater than t to the power two third, you need to get cancellation in such sum. Okay. Now, if you want to go beyond t to the power one third, you need to uh, get a stronger bound. Uh, if when n equals to t, in the generic case, so you need to go beyond t to the power one third, you need to get more cancellation in this, uh, at this level. But also you cannot just take trivial bounds on this side. You need to uh, get some non-trivial bound up to something smaller than uh, two thirds. So maybe you can go up to t to the power two third minus two delta. Here you can get use trivial bound, but from here onwards you need non-trivial bound, which much and much stronger bounds on this, on what in larger and larger. Okay, so uh, there are two parts of getting sub wild. That's what I wanted to say. One is trying to get a better bound in the generic case n equals to t, and also trying to uh, extend the range on this side. Okay, so get non trivial bound for shorter sums as well. Okay, so the exponential sums of degree three is uh, quite recent. And uh, in 2015, I proved a, a subconvexity result for SL3z form. And it says that uh, this L function is bounded by three quarters minus one by 16th plus epsilon. So T to the power three quarter is the trivial bound uh, that you get by uh, trivially estimating the exponential sum. But I showed that there is uh, some cancellation and you can get some saving. Okay, so this is the type of sums that we're looking at here. Okay, and this is the range uh, where you, uh, which is the, uh, is the generic range where you need to get some cancellation. Okay, and uh, the method was uh, just, uh, it's based on what's called the delta symbol approach. And the idea was that uh, there are two terms which are oscillating and you have to show that they are oscillating independently. One is that the Fourier coefficients of the cusp form, they oscillate. And the other one is n to the power it, which also oscillate, okay? So you want to show that these two oscillations are independent, that's the problem. And so uh, my idea was to separate the oscillation of this from the oscillation of this by using the delta symbol. Okay. As you see, I'll give up one proof and there you will see how to do that. And uh, my student uh, uh, Kumar and uh, my postdoc Malisham and my former postdoc uh, Singh, they use this approach and they looked at this more general uh, exponential sum and they could extend uh, the beta uh, up to five by six. Okay, as you can recall that two by D was the trivial range, which is two third over here and they're going beyond two third. Okay, so they had a, so yeah. And I believe that one can do improve on that. 
Now let's go back to degree two. Okay, and in a recent uh, preprint, uh, Agarwal, Holowinski, Lin, and Key, uh, they started this problem using the delta symbol approach. And they have a different delta method, which they call the Bessel delta method, which is uh, based on the orthogonality of the Bessel function. And that's quite natural because you have GL2 Fourier coefficients and the GL2 Fourier coefficients are uh, nicely behaving with the Bessel function. So they wanted to introduce the uh, Bessel uh, function delta symbol over there. And uh, using that, they proved uh, that this is bounded by n to the power half plus beta by three n to the power one minus beta by six. Okay. And, uh, and you'll see that, uh, okay, this part is always non-trivial for any beta greater than zero. But uh, this part is uh, non-trivial only when beta by three is less than half. And that is the same thing as saying that beta is less than three by, uh, three by two. Okay. So this is again uh, the, the wild threshold. So that's the same result that Utila had before or Anton Good had uh, for the special case of uh, uh, Fy to be log uh, T log Y. Okay, so, but it's a different approach. Uh, and there are possibilities of doing something more. Okay, and uh, there's a work in progress. And uh, yeah, so I haven't really written down anything here. So, <laughs> so uh, yeah, so, but I hope everything is correct over here. So I'm looking at the same sum and uh, it looks like that I can take beta going up to four R minus one by four R minus two where R is what's called the ranking constant, which is given by uh, this. Uh, which ranking constant, as I mentioned before, appears when you try to get the optimal uh, bound uh, using the exponent pairs, okay? So if you use uh, other exponent pairs, which are not coming from the AB process, you can go beyond this uh, range, okay? And the good thing about this is uh, this thing is like 1.76, which is larger than 1.5. 1.5 is three by two, right? So you have something, uh, so you get, you're getting cancellation in smaller exponential sums. Okay, so now in the remaining seven minutes, I want to give the proof or maybe the idea of proof. Okay, so yeah, division one. So for uh, simplicity, I'm just writing lambda in instead of lambda fn. So I want to get cancellation over here. So the delta symbol approach is just you separate lambda in from e to the power m beta, right? Uh, so this is delta n minus m, that's why I put delta n is the chronic symbol, delta zero is one, and delta n is zero if n is not, uh, not equal to zero, okay? And uh, the circle method, uh, which was also invented by Ramanujan, is about getting Fourier expansion of, uh, uh, of this very, uh, oddly behaved function. So it's, it's a very spiky function. It is one at one point and zero elsewhere. And, uh, and, and uh, a, a different version of the circle method is, was given by Klosterman. So this is a circle method without any minor arcs. And uh, this is in a very explicit formula. You can take capital Q to be, uh, you can choose your capital Q, this is the parameter that you want to choose. Okay, and, uh, and delta N is equal to this. And uh, there are two parts in this formula, as I always said, that there is an arithmetic part over here and there is an analytic part. So here, uh, everything is be behaving modulo Q. So the modulus is Q. And on here, this part is oscillating like, so small n is say is of capital of size capital N, then it, this part oscillates like N by Q square, okay? So that I will write as K. So my analytic oscillation is always of size K. Okay, so that's the, uh, that's the formula. And now I'm going to replace this in place of delta n minus m over here. And this is the expression. So now we'll see that uh, I have separated the oscillation of the Fourier coefficient from the oscillation of E of m to the power beta. Okay. And now you apply your summation formula for n, you apply uh, for m, you apply the Poisson summation formula, right, for, to this. And for this, you'll get uh, some congruence. So this is the dual length, this is the congruence, so the use, use the usual yoga. And you have the Fourier transform and use the Voronoi summation formula for the other sum, you get lambda in, this A bar becomes A over here. You get a Henkel transform of the 
weight function. Okay, and then uh, we also have that x integral over here. Okay, and since it was oscillating with oscillation of size k, if you execute the x integral using stationary phase or something like that, you can get some cancellation in there too, right? So using these steps, I can transform uh, my original sum into something quite different. Okay, and let's see what we have saved. So as I said that uh, in, in case of Poisson, I, my length reduces from n to this. So this is the, uh, so this is the amount that I save in Poisson, okay? Square root of the initial length by square root of the final length. This is the amount I save from Voronoi, okay? This is the initial length, the final length is k. So square root of n by k. This is this square root is uh, oh it should have square root of k yeah so this k to the power one half okay so this is the square root uh, which comes from the x integral okay that's the saving from the x integral and here uh, this is the saving uh, from the a sum okay it's because q is of size n by k square root and you're saving square root of that so that you get n k to the power one quarter okay. So putting all things together, you'll see that you have saved n to the power three by two minus beta by two. And uh, that's not good because I want to, because when I sacrifice the equation, when I introduce uh, this over here, I lost the equation and losing the equation is like losing capital N. So I need to gain back capital N and something more. So I want this, my saving to be larger than N and that happens over here if beta is less than one. So it's really just the trivial uh, bound over here, but uh, uh, one can do better. Now one can go further. So you just do Cauchy, all right, with whatever sums that you have left, take the n sum outside because it's nice, because here it's like just additive. And here you have some analytic oscillation, open the absolute value square, apply Poisson summation, right? And in the diagonal, you can only save the number of points inside the absolute value, that's a di the length of the diagonal, which comes out to be n to the power beta by k. And in the off diagonal, you save, because the initial length is k, and the analytic oscillation is uh, k, so you have k by root k, and you don't need to worry about uh, this arithmetic part because it's a geometric series with respect to n, okay? So you save the whole thing. So you save k to the power so root k, that's this. Okay, and now you equate this with this to get the optimal value of k, and that turns out to be this. And now if I go back, so I already had this saving over here, and now I am saving uh, square root of k at this level, but we have to go back because I applied Cauchy, so I have to take square root of that. So I have to take k to the power one quarter, and k to the power one quarter is n to the power beta by six. So that's my total saving over here. And so you will see that this is larger than n, this thing is larger than n if beta is less than three by two. So at this point, I am the, at the wild threshold and let's see whether we can do better than that. Okay, so to do better, uh, yeah. So now I looked at the off-diagonal because in the diagonal, there is no point that we cannot save anything more. So let's look at the off-diagonal. So after, uh, after Poisson, I'm left with something like this because the arithmetic part gives me congruence. So there is a congruence like this. And then there is an analytic part, which I'm not re really writing down. That's the main problem. And the main, uh, the pain lies over there to explicitly write down what that is. Uh, anyway, so there is some oscillation over there. And now if I look at MIs, uh, they are of size n to the power beta minus half by root k. And if you look at the QIs, they're of size root n by k. And if beta is larger than one, then this size is larger than this. So now here you see that M1 is only modulo Q1 and M2 is modulo Q2. And so I can uh, write MI as some congruence class modulo QI plus QI times RI, right? Where RI is of size n to the power beta minus one. And if beta is larger than one, then RI has some length, okay? And the nice thing is, now, if I look at the RI sum, it does, it's not involved in the uh, congruence anymore because the congruence only looks at modulo Q1. And so the RI sum will have an oscillatory uh, function over here. And this will be just a GL1 or a degree a rank one exponential sum. And as I said before, for exponential sums of rank one, no matter how short the sum is, you still get cancellation. Okay, so the phase function has amplitude n to the power beta. 
So for example, if beta is three by two, that's the uh, threshold that you want to bridge. Uh, then uh, here, the, your length is like square root of n, and the oscillation is n to the power three by two. So, so this is like the wild range that you have that, uh, you know, if you were looking at the Riemann jeter function and you want to break the wild bound, then you have to get non-trivial bound for n to the power it, where n is smaller than t to the power one third. Okay, so that's the, this is the wild range for the Riemann jeter function, but for Riemann jeter function, we know uh, sub wild bounds. So we can use that and that's the exponent pair, what exponent pair gives, and you get uh, this saving over here. And this is the extra saving that you get, and if you plug that in, and uh, then you're done. That's the uh, proof, and I hope it will work, uh, but it's not completely written down, okay? And uh, with that, I'll stop, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Yeah, apologies for me being delayed, Rito Broto. Thank you so <laughs> no much problem. for such a wonderful talk on this tough uh, topic of, on exponential sums. And uh, now uh, I, I request people, the audience, if they, you have any question uh, for Professor uh, Munshi. You can unmute yourself and... Hello, sir. This is Mithun here. Yeah, Mithun. So my question is, if we consider, uh, instead of uh, any general degree three Fourier coefficient, consider say d three n the coefficient of zeta cube. Uh, the, does it have any advantage or same difficulty will arise to uh, ex, uh, to deduc deduction of this exponential sum? So for d three, uh, the only thing is you can break d three. Uh, yeah, it's not clear whether that will give you any extra saving because, of course, it, you know the the last step um, yeah. is Cauchy, where I was taking out the whole of D three outside. So yeah. Instead of that, you can just take a part of D three outside. So it's like you can break it into three parts, and you can just take two parts outside and put one part inside. So you save more in the diagonal and less in the diagonal, but maybe the optimal value will give you a better saving. So it's not clear whether okay. uh, it works, but yeah, one can try and see. And sir, in also oh, for D3, we will get cluster momentum in applying Voronoi, not that linear we are getting. Uh, for D3, we get cluster sums. No, but... Uh, uh, for GL3, four-year coefficient, we will get cluster momentum. So I think we will not get advantage of saving whole Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. So you'll not get an additive, uh, yeah, you'll not get a geometric series at the end. Nice. GL2. That's another problem. So if the saving is not uh, that much as in GL2. Yeah, thanks. Uh, hello, I have a question. Yeah, so what makes you want to expect uh, that the exponent in the error term will be 1 by 4? Like earlier it was 1 by 2. But what motivates us to expect that uh, it should be one by four? Yeah. So my uh, uh, idea is that in the you know when you write it in terms of exponential sum, you expect a square root cancellation in the exponential sum, and so that will give you an extra power one quarter. Uh, but it's also known that uh, you know there are omega results for uh, uh, divisor function. And, I'll cycle from which corresponds to this. You know, Omega X will for one. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so uh, let us thank Professor uh, Rito Brutum once hey, more for this. Uh, Kalyan, I had a question. Yeah, sure, sure. Please go ahead. Yeah, this is Srini. Thanks, Srini. Yes. Uh, so, uh, Rito uh, you said L of half plus IT uh, for degree two, for all degree two functions, is it bounded by T to the power one third plus epsilon? Uh, now it's not. The white, white bound is available for all degree two? Uh, all degree means, for me, all degree means uh, holomorphic modular forms and mass forms. Uh, I mean, Selber class. Uh, yeah, that's uh, that's a. Uh, so what will be there? Uh, so really what we need is a, a 
uh, Bruno is a nation from Uda. Uh, yeah. But do you know bombs on the coefficients other than n to the power epsilon? No, do you know a little you better than that? As long as you need, you just need the uh, uh, that on average. On average. On average. Ah. Yeah, but it is for Albert plus it is not yet known, right? One third plus epsilon. Yeah, I haven't. Uh, Whether this know. method extends to that or not is something yeah, that, one that, has to see. Really, yeah, that you have to see. Yeah, if you just restrict to self. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because the yeah. working model for yeah, yeah. from half integral be it, it's not known. Yeah. Mm. Uh, interesting. Thank you, Rito. Nice talk. Uh, yeah, thanks, Kenny. Hi, any more questions for Rita Brutha? So thank you, Rita Brutha and Kalyan. Yes, yes. Thank you so much. Thanks, uh, Rita Brutha, for this wonderful talk. Uh, thank you, Kalanda. Sorry again, got delayed a bit. <laughs> no problem. Yeah. The session Bye. starts at 12 noon. Plenary uh, talk by Michael Walshnick. Thank you. Thank you.